what's up guys, Houndish here, and today I wanted to jump in and talk about some Forsaken DLC stuff. Firstly, we have some new gameplay coming from Game Informer, which shows off some stuff in the Tangled Shore, some new supers, some new public events, and a bunch of other interesting stuff. Bungie posted the full version of a new developer insights about the narrative and the story for the expansion, so I'm going to share that with you guys and talk about it briefly. We also have more words about the Dreaming City, a quest that you'll embark on to actually open access to the destination. Got some roundups about Game Informer's recent coverage, changes to world maps inside of Destiny 2 to show new content, and this will tie into the weekly rituals inside of the game. There's also a few other things to talk about, so if you guys enjoy the video, a like below is super appreciated. But for now, let's jump straight into it. So firstly, I mentioned some new gameplay. This does come from Game Informer and their exclusive coverage for the Forsaken expansion. We see some pretty cool cinematics inside of the Tangled Shore. We get to see inside of some of the buildings and some of the complicated structures and a bunch of interesting and secretive looking stuff. We also see the Cryopod public event, and this is taking place in a particular area of the Tangled Shore, with a bunch of legendary weapons that I believe we already saw in the E3 build, but we do see the new Hunter's Arkstrider super right there. We don't get too many details about it or anything like that, but we see it in action. We also see the Warlock in action momentarily, that's the new Ark Warlock. But we get even more really cool gameplay cinematics around the Tangled Shore. And then we see the Hunter with the Fire Knife super. This particular version is a one and done super, and we can see that it does an absolute ton of damage to this boss in a lost sector. There are other very interesting bits of gameplay and things to take a look at inside of the video, so it's absolutely worth checking out. I will link the full original Game Informer video down below. Next up though, Bungie posted a new Narrative Insights trailer, and this is about the story and the campaign inside of the Forsaken DLC. There was a version of this that Game Informer had an exclusive of as well that I showed some images from, but now we can see the full version, so if you didn't have a chance to check it out, here it is. Also, there's some pretty dope music as well. The thing that's really exciting to me about this story is that it's got high stakes, but the stakes are not about saving the universe. They're personal stakes. What if I don't succeed? What if it's not a happy ending? What if I don't win? We said, let's take you to a place where there are no rules. And what does that mean? And then what do you do there? You know, you have to compromise your moral compass a little bit mm -hmm. uh, to see through this reckoning with the folks who killed Cade Six. Mm -hmm. When you boil it down, it's really a revenge story, right? Something terrible happens to one of the most beloved characters in the Destiny universe. Huh, that's a good job, Colonel. All the humor and fun and roguish charm that was uh, brought to bear, having that yanked away from us yeah. is unlike anything we've done in this franchise mm -hmm. yet. Anyone want a hug? Hugs? No? No hugs. It feels like it's just done for shock value at the start, but it's not. I think it makes the world feel rich. You start to see the way characters are reacting to that death and the, and the vacuum that leaves in the universe. I just think about how I feel when I think about Kate dying because I love that character so much. Hey, 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 easy, easy. You're gonna blow a boat. We've always liked Aldrin as a bad guy because he, he's so shifty. Like, even in D1, you don't know if he's actually a good guy or a bad guy. There is no shame in running away, Guardian. It was really exciting for us to have a villain that looked like something that was recognizable and that that made it, the stakes were even more kind of grounded in something that is easy to understand. He's not a giant monster. All the characters in this release are, are conflicted in some way and that they all have some internal conflict that they're trying to resolve. The origin point for all the Barons was how do we create a kind of twisted Western archetype. If we look at, say, those Western movies like Sukiyaki Django and Seven Samurai, or uh, Good, Bad, and the Ugly, each one of their characters, the baddies that you eventually fight, has a persona that you can't mistake for anyone else. If you think about the Mad Bomber who's throwing grenades and they're bouncing off walls and stuff like that, that can you can also kind of squint your eyes and think about that as the bandito with a bunch of dynamite across his chest. The rider who's driving around a pike, well, you could think about that as a horse rustler, right? So each Baron, we really try to pull some Western archetypes, but then twist it in this Destiny universe. When Aldrin is flanked by these folks, you can have it on a poster on your wall and be like, yeah, 
I'm ready to take my mark and mark them and say, I killed all of them, one by one. Because it makes you feel good to actually, you know, hunt them and actually track them down. I'm going to go after them, right? Like, I'm going to crawl on my horse and cross the Wild West and kick down the door and be like, you killed Cade, and put a bullet in him. It's going to be great. So obviously there is some pretty cool stuff inside of the trailer. It's cool to hear the devs talk about the kind of approach to storytelling and how things are going to be a bit different this time around. We do see Prince Aldrin in one of the cinematics. I saw a lot of speculation that Prince Aldrin may potentially be taken because you can see this interesting effect around his head. Kind of have that taken mist start effect. But also a lot of people have pointed out this could simply be because Aldrin is an Awoken character. And a bunch of the Awoken do have a similar effect on their skin, just like Commander Zavala. So it's not entirely clear what we're looking at. I'd love to hear your speculation on it below. I do certainly think it's possible personally though when you consider the infestation of Taken in the Dreaming City, you know that's the word they use, infested, that kind of insidious element to me at least definitely makes it more possible that something like this could be happening to Aldrin. But of course we also see enemies, close-ups of a bunch of the barons which look really cool. I really like this guy, this fallen dude, he's kind of half fallen, half hive. He's been messing with some super dark magic. There's some really cool aesthetics to a bunch of these enemies. And as a lot of people have said, I would super love to see specific loot drops from these guys, you know, exclusive armor, weapons even. It would be an absolutely amazing opportunity for Bungie to do some stuff like that and make these replayable in the end game potentially. But those are just my thoughts. I'd love to hear yours below and any thoughts about Bungie's latest video. Next though, we've heard quite a bit about the Dreaming City, but we haven't actually been able to see too much of it just yet. Although over time, details are beginning to emerge about this space, and we have some details about how the Dreaming City and the endgame element of the space is going to bridge into the campaign. Part of the concept of the Dreaming City is of course to provide endgame content, but also to provide a platform which actually encourages players to go into that space and engage with that content, because there will be elements of this story which are revealed inside of this space. So Game Informer have said that you won't go into the Dreaming City during the main campaign for the game, but upon completing the main campaign portion, there will be a quest that you receive, and this is going to send you to reopen access to the destination. And that's the exact wording that Game Informer used, reopen access to the destination, which kind of gives us a bit of a hint to the story and what's going on. It suggests that there is a state of crisis inside of the Dreaming City. We also know that there is a taken infestation in this place, but Game Informer say when you're sent off on this quest after arriving for the very first time, you're immediately pulled into the Ascendant Realm. And so that's actually going to be one of the first things that you really see in the Dreaming City. But of course, the Ascendant Realm version isn't the main Dreaming City space. So it's kind of creating a little bit of aspiration because Game Informer say going forward, you'll discover how the destination exists in both planes and it's going to take weeks to unravel the mystery. And presumably that's going to be a big part of the kind of story closure, exactly what's been going on for all of this time. Because Bungie do say, despite the fact that the campaign will finish before you go to the Dreaming City, it is inside of this endgame space where you'll see the culmination of everything you've learned so far, and I guess understand what has ultimately caused everything that has happened. Of course this is just the story component that they're giving us additional hints to right here, but we know that mechanically speaking and in terms of actual content there will be a three week cycle to how the Dreaming City is going to appear, so over time this space is going to become visually different. Petrovenge is going to be a vendor and guiding character for Dreaming City, and she's going to be happy housed in different locations during that three week rotation. And Game Informer finished by saying, over time, new missions and secrets will reveal themselves, enemy configurations and even power levels are going to increase. And this happens as the Taken Curse takes a greater hold on the space. Now the important thing to remember here, of course, we're going to be getting 600 power. And so if enemy configurations and power levels of the enemies inside of the Dreaming City are increasing over time, it starts to give us a bit of an idea of the investment that it's going to take to actually reach higher power levels inside of this expansion. There were a lot of changes in the Warmind DLC, but presumably they'll be aiming to increase the power level difficulty and the power requirements that you'll need to actually unlock new gear and make more progress in Dreaming City. That stuff is all going to happen over a number of weeks. So yeah, essentially it looks like max level 
accessing all of the content in this expansion. It's going to be quite a grind, but I think it is worth mentioning, you know, you look at how much new content is going to be added, the new value of gear in the game, random rolls on weapons, mods, hopefully armor perks and other stats being upgraded as well. The grind does become, you know, more worth it and you're more incentivized to make those smaller amounts of progress at a time because you're constantly being rewarded in different ways. And so I think that's going to be really important in this expansion, but those words give us a solid idea about progression in the game, how we'll be required to engage with different types of content, and how new and more powerful rewards will become available over the course of weeks. But now I wanted to talk about a couple of different things. Game Informer, when they spoke about their time at Bungie, spoke a little bit about Destiny 3 and what some of the folks at Bungie are actually doing. So the podcast host actually said, you didn't see Luke Smith and Jason Jones working in some corner of the Bungie building, did you? And the guys from Game Informer actually said they work in a different building right now. They made mention of Destiny 3 and they kind of suggested that, you know, that is what those guys are working on separately from the current live Bungie team. Of course, that is an official confirmation of anything. I just thought it was worth pointing out if any of you were interested. But we also got a few small insights into a few other systems that we'll see in the game. Things like Triumphs. Game Informer said immediately there are different sections for character, destinations, events, Gambit, PvP, Vanguard, Lore, and Time Worn Labors. So these of course are different categories for progress, but Time Worn Labors, they said specifically, are Triumphs which are only trackable during certain time periods. And so that could include things like, I don't know, the Iron Banner or the Faction Rally. We could also have other things baked into it that get updated for, you know, timed events. But there will be a specific section which tracks more or less all of the event style stuff in the game. But there we go, guys. That is going to summarize today's video. I hope you have enjoyed it. If you have, a like is super appreciated below. Also, let me know your thoughts on any of the stuff we've spoken about in this video. If you are new to the channel, be sure to hit subscribe and hit that notification button as well, the bell icon next to the subscribe button. That way you won't miss out on any videos. Check out my sponsor, Gamerlink. They have a fantastic LFG and clan app for Android and iOS. You can use it to find other players for raids and nightfalls, trials, or whatever else it may be. But also it has really great clan features, so you can build a persistent team, keep in touch, and plan gaming sessions with each other that way. You'll also get an awesome houndish badge if you sign up for Gamerlink using the link below. So check that out if you're interested. For now though, guys, I appreciate you watching as always, and I hope you have an awesome day.